There aren't enough operating rooms. There aren't enough antibiotics. There aren't enough instruments. There aren't enough gauze. There aren't enough anesthetics, right? So a lot of these doctors that are there, you know, they have nothing to work with. And that's a big, big issue in that, yes, they can they can help and maybe give these overworked uh, uh, Palestinian doctors and surgeons who are, and nurses who are fantastic. But, you know, if your resource is limited, you, you can only do so much. There's only three operating rooms and the volume of people coming in is huge. All the other hospitals have been destroyed because you think you, you see, Kim, this um, like. I mean, the, the and, I, and I will say, I mean, the Israeli killing machine, I don't think we've ever seen this level of killing in such a concentrated short time ever, as far as I know, at least in my life in, in, in history. Uh, it's been a powerful and potent killing machine, the Israeli army and, and, and what they've done to the civilian population. You know, basically the whole, so as, as a physician, the whole healthcare system has been destroyed. And um, the bizarre thing and really strange thing is they've not hit it. All their politicians have made open statements about what they want to do. So it's not like they've, they've hit it. It's not like I'm making any guesses. We just have to even just listen to the International Court of Justice. And, and I mean, they quoted a lot of Israeli politicians saying this. So it's not like you can't, you can't make this stuff up, nor am I making this up. They've made statements about what they want to do, uh, about how they want to uh, cleanse the population. And so what they've done is uh, hospitals have been bombed, okay? And uh, once they've been forcefully evacuated, they've been detonated and brought to the ground. The ones that have not been bombed, the Palestinians have tried to repopulate them because, you know, uh, unlike what they may say, there's still Palestinians in northern Gaza, central Gaza. They're getting injured. There's still fighting going on there. And um, there's still airstrikes, and, and, and so people get injured. And um, so what they've done is that as, as soon as... Um, the doctors move the patients in, they get their snipers and their drones coming in and firing at patients, firing at doctors. Um, three, over three, I mean, back then, about a month ago, it was 300 healthcare workers got have been killed, have been, many of them targeted specifically uh, for their specialties and, and whatnot, and, and they've been killed, uh, whether it's nurses, doctors, uh, paramedics, right? Now it must be at least 400 now because this is about a month, month ago, right? And um, about 45 doctors have been kidnapped. Um, many have, have not been heard from. The ones that have been heard from, in, including um, the director of a major hospital who was a general surgeon. Many people in the UK knew him. He was tortured. He was stripped naked uh, and tortured um, every day. And, uh, he's not, and if you see, um, I forgot his name, but if you see his uh, interviews, uh, he's not the same man again. And he was a, he was a director of the hospital, a very successful general surgeon. So the so so this is how they're treating doctors. So that's that's one. But in order to collapse a healthcare system, it's a multifactorial thing. They know that their two thousand pound bombs and missiles are not going to penetrate the tunnels because some of these tunnels are really really deep. But mm-hmm. what they'll get is infrastructure. They'll get sewage and water pipes, and that's that's not by accident. It's it's in, in intentionally done. The sewage and water pipes are gone. The sewage water is mixing with the with the drinking water, and uh, and you get bacteria and disease uh, uh, going. They're not getting any water in because that's been blocked along with food. Uh, there's no food, so they're all malnourished, which means that their immune system is decreased, so they're more susceptible to illnesses and infectious diseases and whatnot. I mean, and the other thing is that they know that there's about ten to fifteen thousand bodies under the rubble. Like that's how destructive the diabolical killing machine has been, how efficient it's been. There's about 15,000 bodies at least. And now it's a raining season. So the rain is, is, is mixing with these decomposing dead bodies and all that bacteria is mixing with the water supply, mixing with the environment. And so gastrointestinal diseases are rampant. Hepatitis A is epidemic. They're living in closed corners, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, closed quarters, many of them, one one room, 100 of them in one room. So disease spreads, cholera, typhoid's not far away. There's no antibiotics, okay? So I, I think the, the, I believe the plan has been, and again, it's not what I believe, it's what they've said, right? Is that if the bombs don't kill you, it's like sort of medieval way of, of cleansing a population. The bombs don't kill you, disease will. 
right? Yeah. And they made sure that there's nothing to return to, right? So, uh, so basically what happens is that once this is over, and I hope it's going to be over, it, it may not seem like it now with Rafa being attacked, is that there'll be nothing to go back to. So yeah. the sick will have to leave, right? And they know the sick will have to leave to get care because there's no health system remaining. And that's and that's been their plan that they've orchestrated and that they've not hidden from the public. Right. Yeah, that is uh it's a it's a different and um less obvious way to commit a genocide is if if you know that the disease will just kill you. We don't have to do it. We don't have to be the ones to actually bomb or round you up in a camp and exterminate you in some other way, right? It's it's that the disease will get you. It's kind of like what you know, we know that giving smallpox to the Native Americans back in the day and you know, knowing that it was going to just run rampant and kill them. Uh, this is so and that is, I think, the big worry is that is that the worry that most of you are having now as physicians? You're worried about the disease spreading. You know, Kim, if uh, if the uh, war on Gaza uh, stopped now, uh, if it stopped now, um, thousands are going to die anyways, okay? Because of the fact that the, um, you know, UNICEF predicts that there is anywhere from one to 3,000 children who've been amputated, for example, right? And uh, in and, and amputated in a very poor way because it was done often without anesthesia and in a very rushed way. You know, here in Canada or the U.S., an average child who's amputated goes through, will go through about nine to 12 operations right, with prosthetic fitting, adjustment of the stump, whatever, right, till uh, till they become adults, right? Where is that going to happen now? Many of these kids have lost their parents, their mothers, their, their fathers, their uncles, their grandparents, their uncles, their aunts, their siblings, all support system is gone. So who will support these kids? In what capacity when everything is flattened? 90% of the, of the Gaza Strip has been flattened. And... Um, you know, I mean, the amount of damage that has happened is not going to take a few years. It's going to take decades, right? It's going to take decades to reconstruct. So what's going to happen to this, uh, to them? Disease is rampant, right? People are dying of, of, of renal failure because they're drinking toilet water, because they're drinking dirty water, because they don't have water. And they're, and they're getting kidney failure because of infections and whatnot. People are dying. Forget about the regular conditions like cancer or diabetes or high blood pressure or whatever. I mean, you know, that's not even being taken care of. Like no one's even paying attention to those conditions that people had from before. It's 2 million, 2.2 million people you're talking about, right? So um, it's, uh, it's a very difficult scenario, yeah, even if it stopped today. Yeah, but it's not stopping. No, it's, it's not worse. stopping, right. Yeah. Right. Were you traumatized? I mean, you, you said that you've you've seen so many other places, but this was the worst. I mean, did you were you how do you even function on a day to day basis? Like what was the ratio, of, I would say, of people coming in and then they just die and you're like, well, there's another dead person. And here's you know, I mean, I just would think it would just be in the beginning so shocking, but you have to work right. You have to get through this. You've got people who need to be saved. And so you're rushing through trying to do what you can to save all these people, not even having a chance to probably process it. But I mean, how do you deal with, I mean, the the death and these children coming in that are, you know, no fault of their own. They're just little babies. They're just little three-year-olds and they're being blown up. You know, they're being, uh, their bodies are just riddled with shrapnel. I mean, how do you process this emotionally? You know, when I was there, I mean, I mean, just today I, I saw this morning, I was a bit upset. Um, I saw an image, you may have seen an image, an image of that girl that was blown away and that's hanging on the wall, yeah. right? With her legs half cut off because a bomb exploded and she, and she just flew. And, and I mean, th that's a that's a horrific image. That for them, they've seen that before. It's not the first, they've seen that in, in the hundreds and thousands. You know, when I was there, it was, you know, I, I, I followed their lead, right? I mean, they're, you know, what I learned about Palestinians, and I've never been around Palestinians. I mean, I've, I I know some Palestinian Americans or Palestinian Canadians, you know, but mm -hmm. I've never been in Palestine before. And what I discovered was that they're the most, and I'll come back to the question you asked me, they were the most resilient, steadfast, strongest people of faith that I have ever met, like I've ever met. And, um, and, and that 
kept me calm and at peace because I was amongst them. They're generous. You know, um, they, you know, when, when, when someone dies, it's their custom to, uh, it's, it's their custom to thank God, you know, thank God, I, uh, you know, or praise be to God that I lost a brother. I lost an uncle. I lost three cousins. They've all lost something, right? I lost uh, an aunt and uncle. And uh, basically, so, um, very resilient, uh, very resilient. And I think they're, I think for them, survival is, um, uh, is their form of resistance, right? Yeah. So uh, for them, yeah. So for them, uh, uh, for them, the fact that they will survive uh, is uh, is a form of resistance. And so, right. They say existence that, is resistance for them. Yeah. Existence Just is existence. Resistance for them. Yeah. yeah. So they would they would fight to save every single life. They wouldn't give up. Maybe someone here would give up in uh, in Western medicine, but they would fight to save every single life, and they would not give up. And so, based on that, I kind of just sort of got engulfed in that and their steadfastness was infectious and it, 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 it calmed me down. And, uh, then I was just kind of working from like 9 p.m. 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, and then when you finally, uh, I, I still want to talk about some of the things that you saw there, but when you did come home and you were finally able to like decompress from everything, what was that like for you? Were you, did you just think, Oh my God, what did I just go through? And just kind of the trauma set in from everything you had seen. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 lucky I've got a very supportive family and and friends. And so they were there. And um, you know, I also got very busy in uh in speaking out uh about what's happening in Gaza, in educating people, you know, what the ground looks like. Um, what the scene on the ground is. And I got right back into work. I got into mm. my next day. I was operating. I was seeing patients. I love my patients. I'm very dedicated to my patients here. And I just got to working. And um, honestly, up to now, I have really haven't had time to reflect. My heart still is in Gaza. I actually didn't want to leave. I felt guilty leaving because I'm the one that, that gets to leave, right? Uh, I'm the one that gets to leave to peace and security and stability. I'm blessed. They get to stay in that suffering. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been it's been up and down. I must admit, it's been up and down. But you go on because, I mean, to be honest, it's nothing compared to what they're going through right now. I was speaking to one of the doctors who who I worked who lives in Rafa, and who I worked with. Uh, he was the head of the Department of Ophthalmology, and and they're scared because he lives in Rafa. He goes that they don't know what, where to go. He goes like he goes. I, I don't know where to go now because Rafa is the southernmost part. It was safe, and there's 1.5 million people concentrated uh, in that area, and you have this huge Israeli killing machine coming and bombing. How do you counter that? Like, how do you survive? I don't know. It's it's unimaginable that we ha we as a world have come to that. I mean, I think from a healthcare point of view. I mean, just the health. Now there's only one hospital left. Now European Gaza is the only fully functional hospital left. And if that hospital goes, they're asking them to move up to the center of Gaza or north. There's nothing there left. Right. It's flat. It's a joke that they're saying that to people. They're yeah. saying to people, okay, now you can go nor north. And people are like, to where? I mean, you bombed literally everything is gone. Yeah. There's nowhere to so go and sit amongst rubble. I mean, that's. There's nowhere to go. So they know that they're saying that in order to kind of appease um, the world.